Hey guys, welcome to chapter three. We're looking at federalism. And there's three types of governments that you need to know for the AP test. That is unitary governments, federalist governments, and confederate governments. Okay, three types. Well, we want to talk about each of those three and then we're going to really concentrate on federalism because that's the kind of system that we have here in the United States. So the first one is a unitary system. So in a unitary system, what happens is the central government, so like the, the country government, is super strong. And the parts, so maybe the state's governments, are very weak. Okay, And so the central government has all the power. In a confederal government, what's going to happen is the states, the pieces are going to have the, the bulk of the uh, power. And then the central government, that country government, is going to be very weak. Okay, and then in a federalist government, they're going to share power. The, the states, the pieces, and that central government, they're going to share power. Okay, so there's three types. Now, a unitary system, one big thing that you, gotta, you really want to know is about 90% of the countries in the world have a unitary system. They do not have a federal system like we have in the United States. Um, the federal system in the United States is shared power, again, between the states and the central government. Now, a confederal government, um, very few of those are going to, you're going to be able to find, but if we just think back to uh, chapter two, we looked at the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they set up a confederation um, in the United States to start with, and what happened was there was no power in the central government, if we remember that. There was no, cent there was no executive branch, there was no judicial branch, there was no power resting in the central government because it all rested in the states. So it was intentional that they set it up that way, and they knew that, and they called it a confederation, the Articles of Confederation. Okay, so in the United States, now we have a federal system where we're going to share that power. And so that's what we're going to focus on for this chapter is shared power. So why choose federalism? Well, there's a few different reasons. First, it decentralizes politics. Okay, uh, it takes a lot of the, um, the, the power out of the state the central government's hands. It spreads out that power. Um, instead of just allowing the federal government to have that choice, uh, we are able to spread that power out. And so if we look um, in the original constitution, the only way that you could have, you could elect somebody was to your representative to the House of Representatives. So you'd have all of the members of the House of Representatives, you selected one of them. The Senate uh, they are selected by the state legislators. You don't get to elect them. The president is elected by the Electoral College. You don't get to elect them. And the federal judges are appointed. And so the only person that you would be able to vote for in a unitary system, if we set it up this way, would be your representative in the House. However, because we have that federal system, we spread out that power. We have more of a say in what happens. And so we're able to vote for a governor. We're able to vote for state senators, state representatives, mayors, uh, city clerks, all those different positions. And the flip side of that is going to be there are more entryways into the government. Instead of just, if you aren't that House of Representative, um, representative well, how are you going to get in? How, or how are you going to get yourself into the government game? And so now you can run for city alderman or for a county, county uh, office or for a school board. There are many, many, many uh, entry routes into our government. And that is because of the federal system. So it allows for a lot of decentralization of the, po the politics. It's not all focused at the national level. We spread it out among the states and the national government. So for those of you who remember back to chapter two, you may be thinking to yourself, Mr. C, we read the Constitution. There is no mention of federalism anywhere in the Constitution. And I say, yes, there is. And I say, we just have to look for it because the word federalism may not be there, but the concept is there and it is in the amendment that has one of maybe the most power of the Bill of Rights, and that is the 10th Amendment. The 10th Amendment um, says that powers that are not delegated to the U.S. by the Constitution, so if we don't give the power to the judicial branch, we don't give it to the executive branch, we don't give it to the, uh, to the Congress, 
then and also if it is not forbidden by the Constitution, like ex post facto laws perhaps, uh, if it is not forbidden by the Constitution and if the Constitution doesn't already give the power to somebody else, the states get that power or the people get that power. And so we devolve that power. We take that power that the national government has and we give it to the states or to the people. That's devolution. We're taking the power for the top and giving it down, okay? So we wanna know that concept and that's super important for the 10th Amendment, okay? So the 10th Amendment automatically starts to set up our federal system. We're saying that if these powers right here that we've talked about, maybe uh, Article 1, Section 8, all those that laundry list of things that the Congress can do, um, and the, what, can the, what the executive branch can do, what the, the courts can do, um, if, if it's not listed there, the states get that power. And so we start to think about, okay, why does Illinois have a speed limit of 70 while other states maybe have 75 or 80? It's because of our federal system. Okay, where part of that government is decided in um, Washington, D.C., but some of it is decided here in Illinois. And so uh, there's nothing in the Constitution that says uh, that the Congress gets to set the speed limit. Therefore, each state gets to. There's nothing in the Constitution about voting laws. There's nothing in the Constitution about uh, education or about gay marriage or about marijuana usage all these different things and so they have become muddied in the states um, and now the national government wants to get involved in them and so we're going to have to look at supreme court cases to decide who really has the power and so the supreme court acts as a um, as an umpire kind of to decide who has that power and this is all because of 10th amendment Now, the Tenth Amendment is rivaled by Article VI, where we have the Supremacy Clause. The Supremacy Clause says that the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Okay, it's number one. It's the top. It's the it's the head. And we talked about this a little bit in Article Two, uh, or not Article Two, in Lecture Two um, for last week. But we're, we want to look. We want to revisit it again because it's super important to our system of federalism. Okay, and so if we look. The Supremacy Clause says the U.S. Constitution is the number one, it's the supreme law of the land. Then it goes to laws passed by Congress. Then it goes to state constitutions. Then it goes to state statutes. And then it goes to counties and to cities and on down. We talked about that. Now here's the problem. What if Congress tries to pass a law and that law the states don't agree with? And the states look at it and they say, wait, you don't have the right to set our drinking age. You don't have the right to set our smoking age, our voting age. You don't have that right, Congress, because it's not in that laundry list of demands or powers that uh, are in Article 1, Section 8. And so what happens? Now we wind up going through the court system. We get to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has to do a reading of the Constitution and using the Implied Powers Clause, using um, the Supremacy Clause, using the Tenth Amendment, decide who does get that final power. Okay, and so we have to go through that whole list of who has the peck in that pecking order, who has the the ability to make that law. Okay, so the Tenth Amendment is often called the Reserved Powers Amendment because the powers are reserved for the states and for the people. Okay, and so those powers that the national government gets are called enumerated. They're enumerated in the Constitution. They are written out. The powers that the states and the people get are reserved powers. And then the, the ones that are between, the ones that are held by both, are called concurrent powers. Those three are going to be important. Enumerated powers, reserved powers, and concurrent powers. You want to know all three. And what we want some examples of each as well. So um, the national government, the enumerated powers, they can uh, coin money. We don't have different monies in every single state, right? Uh, we don't have the, the state currency of Georgia, for example. Each state has the same currency, and that is set by the United States Congress. And remember, Congress has the ability to coin money. It says so in uh, Article 1, Section 8. Therefore, it is a enumerated power. Now, another one would be to declare war, okay? That is a central 
power. It is not a power that the states get. We don't have Massachusetts going to war with England. Okay, we have a the United States would be going to war with England. It is a central power. Now, if we want to look at some state powers, maybe we want to look at how we punish criminals. Okay, that is a state power. It is not written in the Constitution how to do so. If we want to look at how we conduct elections, and this is hugely different across the United States, and we're actually going to do an activity on this a little bit later in the course, um, how different states differ, but we want to look at this and we want to just examine that it's very different state to state. And that's because conducting elections is not in the Constitution, and therefore the power goes to the states. And then some of those concurrent powers would be uh, to uh, levy taxes. We pay state taxes and we pay national taxes to maintain law and order. We have the FBI, but we also have the police force in town or the state police. And so those are things that both do, okay? And so um, concurrent powers, enumerated powers, reserve powers. We want to know the difference between each of them, and we want to go in strong with some examples in case they do ask this in a free response question. This would be a great free response question. And so we want to go in with some knowledge beforehand going in, okay? Okay, so let's get tricky. Let's get tricky, and let's decide how we're going to read the Constitution, okay? And so Thomas Jefferson would be what we call a strict constructionist. Strict constructionist. And this is what this means, okay? It means that, first off, anti Thomas Jefferson's an anti-federalist, and so he believes that the power should not rest with the central government, all right? We know that already. We talked about that. Hopefully, we, you know about that from chapter two, okay? And so he, he, he does not believe that the government deserves a lot of power. He, they're fearful that that central government is going to abuse that power. And so he says that Congress is limited to the expressed and a few implied powers. So basically he says that laundry list on Article 1, Section 8, that's what, po that's what Congress can do. And that elastic clause, that would mean something like it has to be completely linked. And so Congress has the right to, or the power to raise an army. Therefore, they can uh, purchase weapons. Okay? That would make sense if you're trying to raise an army. You'd want some, you want some machine guns and some tanks and things. That goes A plus B, and we see C very easily, right? Okay. Um, what he would argue is that um, using that implied powers to pass civil rights legislation, using this, uh, this, um, that implied powers to pass uh, overreaching marijuana laws, that what he would argue does not fall under the... Uh, the preview of the um, the Congress. He would say, no, that is not what is meant by the elastic clause. He is reading the Constitution strictly, word for word, this is what it means. And so he is a strict constructionist. Now the flip side of the strict constructionist is going to be a liberal or a loose constructionist, okay? Alexander Hamilton is a terrific example here. He would be a federalist, and so he believes that this, that power can rest with the central government, and we're going to spread that power out, some of it to the states as well. But he wants a strong central government, okay? And so he is going to say that congressional powers can be interpreted broadly. And so we, the implied powers clause is going to, the elastic clause, that is going to be huge for loose or uh, liberal constructionists. Um, and we're going to see that strengthened in McCulloch versus Maryland. McCulloch versus Maryland. It's our first Supreme Court case. Remember, we're going to know 15 of them by the end of the course. McCulloch versus Maryland. There's going to be another video on it coming right after this one. And so we want to make sure that we watch that. You cannot go into the test without knowing McCulloch versus Maryland. But basically what you want to know right now is it strengthened the implied powers. It stretched that elastic clause. It made... Uh, Congress much more powerful than the anti-federalists ever wanted them to be. And so this is going to be a really important court case for us. And we're going to talk about that, like I said, in, in the next video that should be dropping within the next day or so. We definitely want to know McCulloch versus Maryland. And the end story is it strengthened the implied powers, that elastic clause for Congress. Okay, so once we have the implied powers uh, um strong for for Congress, it starts stretching even more, and we start to be able to use uh, other clauses, such as the Commerce Clause, which is used in Gibbons versus Ogden. In Gibbons versus Ogden, the uh, Congress is able to say, we're in charge of interstate commerce, and therefore they are able to dictate different things in, um, in a steamboat um, 
dispute in, in New York, in New Jersey. Um, and so the, the Congress is able to use these implied powers. They're able to stretch things using the Commerce Clause this time. And the Commerce Clause is going to be uh, super important when we get to racial equality. Um, the Commerce Clause is going to say um, anything interstate related, Congress gets a say in the end. Okay, And so Congress is able to pass the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s because of the Commerce Clause. They are able to uh, force employees uh, or employers to, um, to go towards this uh, Civil Rights Act. And if they are not uh, adhering to it, they can shut down these businesses because of uh, the Commerce Clause. Now, does this have anything to do with commerce? Yes, no, strict constructionist, loose constructionist, depends on the Supreme Court at the time. And remember, at the time is going to be important because the Supreme Court is fluid just like the Constitution is. And so that Supreme Court, it matters who the, who the, uh, pres the president puts up on that Supreme Court because it can sway the country one way or another as far as what the laws mean. And so it's super important to know about the Supreme Court with these. But Gibbons versus Ogden is a case that you should know but it's not one of the 15 that you have to know on the test. And so there's not going to be a separate video on it, but just know that the Congress is stretching their power here with the implied powers in McCulloch versus Maryland and now the Commerce Clause in Gibbons Ogden. Okay, so the next little bit of the our Constitution that we want to look at is Article 4. And Article 4 is going to be kind of relations between states. And so we've got the full faith and credit, clause, we've got the extradition, and we've got privileges and immunities. And we need to know all three. We talked a little bit about them in, our, in uh, lecture two, so we're going to breeze through them a little quick, but we want to take a look at them real quick here. Full faith and credit means if I have a driver's license in this state, I don't have to get one in every single state, that my documents are secure in each state that I go to. If I'm married in this state, I don't have to get remarried if I move to Arkansas. Okay, Each state that I go to, I am already married. Uh, it also means that my debt is good from state to state as well. So if I have student loans in Illinois, if I just move to Texas, they're not erased, I, now, I still have student loans in Texas. Uh, and so uh, full faith and credit that the documents that we go from state to state with are, are, are recognized in state to state. The next one is extradition. Now, if I commit a crime in one state and I flee to another state, um, Illinois can, can ask that state to send me back to that, to that original state to stay on trial for my, for my crimes. Now, sometimes if my crime is um, a speeding ticket, uh, is Illinois really going to want to pay to bring me back from California? Probably not. If I committed a, a, uh, a robbery or a murder, maybe Illinois is going to want to pay to get me back so that, I have, so that they can have justice here in, the, in, in Illinois. Okay, so that's extradition, and that is in Article 4 as well. And the last one is privileges and immunities. Privileges and immunities means that we can't discriminate against non residents. That means if um, I go to Utah where the speed limit is 80, I don't have to go 70 just because it's 70 in Illinois. I still get to go 80 just like everybody else on the road. Uh, if I go to Colorado, um, the marijuana laws there apply to me even though I'm from Illinois where the, the marijuana laws are, are very different. Okay, And so um, when I go to Nevada, I am able to uh, place a, a sports uh, a sports bet, uh, where in Illinois it, it is illegal to do so. And so all these different things, um, you are, um, you fall under the state law that you are in, not what state you are from. Okay. And so that is privileges and immunities. You get all the privileges and all the immunities that the people of that state ought to are already get as well when you enter um, into that state. Okay, now there's two types of federalism that we want to know. We're going to start getting into the meat of it or maybe the dessert of it right now, okay? And so the first kind of federalism is called dual federalism. Dual federalism is separate. We are separating the powers. Here's what the national government can do. Here's what the uh, state government can do. And we want to turn that on its side now. Okay? Because this is oftentimes called, and this is not a Mr. C thing, this is, a, this is a real term, that it is called layered cake federalism. Layered cake federalism. Because we have, here's what the national government can do, here's what the state government can do, and they don't 
come in contact. We, we got the, the frosting in between there, okay? They don't come in contact with each other. Here's what one can do, here's what the other can do, and then there's kind of some concurrent law um, powers in between there, like taxation maybe. But for the most part, the, the powers are very separate. You get to do this, we get to do this. And that's how it is separated out. Now, the alternate type of federalism is cooperative federalism. Cooperative federalism is when um, it's, it's often called marble cake. So if you, in marble cake, if you were to make a vanilla cake maybe, and then pour in some chocolate um, cake into, into it, and take a knife and just kind of swirl together. How do you separate the two, right? You can't. And so that is marbled cake federalism, cooperative federalism. And there is an, an absolute advantage to uh, cooperative federalism. There are shared costs, so we are not, um, we don't have to have all the say, all national, all state. We can start mixing some of this stuff, okay? We can start blending it together. Um, we have federal guidelines, and so there are states that may be, um, for, for, for example, right now, uh, there was a Supreme Court case last year that said that um, states could have um, sports uh, betting if they want to. And so um, a lot of states that were a little bit him hawing about this now maybe are looking at it saying, okay, if we're going to have federal guidelines to make sure that um, betting is on the up and up, that people aren't throwing games and things like this, that's a good thing for sports as well as for the betting community. And so more states are getting, getting behind that, okay? It's not kind of a backroom deal anymore. And so... Um, it definitely helps having those federal guidelines, the state working with the federal government. We have shared administration. We are able to have uh, states go out and do some of the work that the federal government needs to do. Um, and the federal government can kind of guide the states and here's how they want to do things. So cooperative federalism, and this is the type of federalism that we are currently operating on in, in, the, in the United States. Um, what we want to know is timeline. When we start the United States, start the United States like we were starting an engine, right? Uh, in the 1700s, when the United States begins, we are operating under dual federalism. Here's what you get to do. Here's what the states get to do separate. And it lasts all the way up until Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. In the New Deal, his programs, he said, let's work together with the states and let's bring this all together. Rather than having everything separate, let's combine everything. And once it's been combined, how do you separate it? Okay, that marble cake. And so we still are operating under that marble cake, that cooperative federalism system here in the United States in 2019. All right, folks, so two types of federalism, cooperative and dual federalism. But there's a third term that we want to know that's going to kind of go with cooperative federalism, and that's fiscal federalism. So let's take a, let's take a think for a second, all right? Let's take a think. So we've got the national government has no ability to do anything with education, right? They have no uh, constitutional authority to make laws on education. States get that right because education is not listed in the, in the Constitution, right? So what's going to happen now with fiscal federalism is the national government finds a way to kind of get involved with education, and it's through money. Cash is king here, my friends. Cash is king. And so if we think about this, what's going to happen is the national government is going to say, here, Illinois, here is some money to fund your schools. And Illinois is going to say, thank you so much. We needed this money. And the national government is going to say, yeah, but you only get it if. And so this, these grants are going to be coming into the states if they follow what the national government wants. And so it shifts that federalist power. It shifts that power out of the states and to the national government, okay? Because the national government gets to set the, the limits on how this money is spent. And therefore, um, if we think about it at the end, the national government is basically setting the laws that it had no business doing in the first place, right? But now because it has the money to give, it can now set these laws. Okay, you following me? All right, so this is gonna be grants. Grants are cash from the national government that are gonna be distributed to the state and local governments. Um, in 2007, there was over $460 billion in grants from the national government to the states. Um, four years later in 2011, it was 640 billion. And now there are trillions, with a T and an S at the end, trillions of dollars in grants that come from the national government to the states. And again, this is going to be used for the national government to influence 
the states and to try and get the states to do what the national government wants them to do. This is fiscal federalism. We're going to work through grants. All right, so let's talk about these grants in fiscal federalism. Um, the first type that we want to know are categorical grants. And here's the, if I say to you categorical grants, I want you to say two things back to me. Two words, strings attached. Categorical grants, strings attached. In a categorical grant, the national government is saying, here's some money if you do this, if you do that. Here is how you get the money. Okay, categorical grants. The first type that we want to look at is crossover sanctions versus cross-cutting requirements. Okay, crossover sanctions means uh, we might give you money here for you to do something over there. And so, for example, a lot of states were given money for their highway systems if they raised their drinking age to 21. Okay, now the drinking age has nothing to do with roads. Okay, but the national government saw an opportunity to get that national drinking age up to 21. Now there is no national drinking age. Each state just happens to have it set at 21 because the national government came in with bags of cash to fix their roads. That was money that they did not have to burden their state with. That means Texas is going to have Illinois people helping them pay for their roads. Why wouldn't they say yes to that? Just move that drinking age to 21 instead of 18. So we look at these things and you can see how we're, the states are gonna be influenced by that money. That's a crossover sanction. We're gonna influence this by giving money here, okay? Now a cross-cutting requirement is going to say if your program, if your organization, if your state gets money from the national government through some kind of a grant, then you have to do this over here. It's non-negotiable. If you don't do that, you are gonna lose that money over there. So, uh, for example, a lot of uh, civil rights um, information is going to be here. Um, the ADA, and so, um, like for example, uh, LP High School gets money from the national government. They get money for, uh, for reading programs through, through different things like that. And so, uh, that money will be cut off if the, if LP High School were all of a sudden going to be discriminatory in their hiring practices, okay? You have to follow these guidelines in order to make sure that you're getting the money over here. As long as you're getting money, you have to follow these guidelines over or all that national money is going to go away, okay? That's cross-cutting requirements. It's across the board, okay? Now, the next one we want to look at is project grants. Project grants, um, these are normally going to be applied for, um, and so a state is going to say, we want to build a bridge, or we want to build a road, we want to build a rail system. And they're going to fill out an application, um, and they're going to send that to Washington. Washington is going to say, uh, yes, no. And um, then the, the money is going to be sent to the states. Now, here's the kicker. The money can only be used for that. So let's say, for example, uh, they want to build this bridge um, that crosses the Illinois River. Okay. The state of Illinois wants to build this bridge, and this, the money is said, the, the Congress says, yes, let's do that, let's build that bridge. And then um, a tornado comes through and rips down two other bridges north of where they want to build this bridge. And the, the state of Illinois says, oh, we'd really like to use that money to move that bridge to a new look. Not able to do so. The money that was earmarked for that has to be used for that or it has to go back to Congress and then the, the application system would go through again. So that's a project grant. We're going to use it for a very specific project. Okay. Now another kind of grant is going to be a formula grant. And so this is going to be a little bit more cut and dry, black and white. And so we're going to do, uh, there's going to be a formula in Washington, D.C. that says maybe for a school system that says you have this many Hispanics, you have this many African Americans, you have this many uh, Asian Americans, you have this many um, of, of whatever. We go all the way down and then we say, okay, because of this, and then we look at um, the um, the, the money coming into the school, um, are, how many people are low income versus versus wealthy. And we start to add all these things up and there's a formula that kicks out and it says, uh, this school gets this many dollars. It just says it, says it right at the end. Now that money goes straight to the school. There's, it's non-negotiable, okay? They can't say, oh, but we really would like this because we need to, no. This is how it goes, okay? This is how much money you get. That's a formula grant. So crossover sanctions, cross-cutting requirements, project grants, formula grants, those are all categorical grants because they have strings attached.
Okay, now the strings attached also have a name, okay? And that is mandates. Mandates are the conditions of the grants. And so if we want to talk mandate, the number one place that you want to go, if you get a free response question that talks about mandates, the first thing I want you to think about is no child left behind. You've all heard it, but here's what's going on. The national government said, if you as Illinois or Texas or California, but let's stick with Illinois because that's where we're at. If you, Illinois, are able to get all of your kids in your school to this level on a standardized test, we're going to give you money. Okay? And if you don't, we're going to start taking away money. Okay? And so the first few years of this program, Illinois is getting their money. The schools are getting their money. And then they start increasing the scores little by little. Okay? And so eventually, schools are not making, that, making that, those marks, and all of a sudden, they're getting less and less money from the national government. Okay? You, you get this money, you get it. So that is a mandate. You are mandated to do this. And if you don't make it, then you have to put in one of these programs mandated by the federal government in order to continue getting federal dollars. Okay? And so there's a condition there. There's a string attached. There's a mandate. Okay. The next thing we want to look at then is block grants. Now, block grants devolve power from the national government. We talked about that a couple minutes ago. Devolution of power is going to go from the national government down to the states. We talked about it in the 10th Amendment. It's back here with block grants. Block grants, there are very few strings attached, um, and it is up to the discretion of the state how to use that money. So, for example, the state might get X amount of dollars in a block grant to spend on transportation. Well, in Texas, they might need to use it on roads. In Illinois, maybe we're going to use it on a rail system. In uh, California, their airports need to be upgraded. So that X, that dot, that money can be used at the discretion of the state. Okay, there are few strings attached. All that the, the condition there is only transportation, and so there's the the state gets to decide how to use the money. Okay, so that's a block grant. Here is a block of money, spend it well. Okay, that's kind of how to think of a block grant. And so uh, we've got different kinds of grants and we want to know all of them for federalism. We've got um, dual federalism and we've got um, cooperative federalism. We've got categorical grants and block grants and mandates. We've got all these different things. Folks, please pay attention to these in your text. It's going to be important for the quiz, it's going to be more important for the test, and it's going to be even more important come May when we're taking that AP exam. Folks, um, this is an important chapter. This is a really important chapter. There, if you're going to get uh, questions from uh, the first unit on the AP exam, something's going to be asked about federalism, okay? It's just going to happen. And so we need to know federalism pretty strongly. Um, Please read the chapter. You've got this. Uh, I'm also am going to include a bunch of videos that I made, uh, snort, short snippets, uh, not snorts, uh, short snippets, like 60 second videos of different um, um, kind of uh, terms and, um, and phrases that were, are in this chapter. And so they'll be able to be able to kind of flash review really quick. Um, and so, like I said, like just 60 second videos so that you can kind of maybe get, like I, I understood the whole video, but I don't want to watch that whole 30 minute video Mr. C posted. I just want to know what a mandate is. I just want to know what, what McCulloch versus Maryland is about. Okay, and so you can check out those videos really quick and get that information. I'm gonna post that in the classroom as well. If you were interested in before getting them in the classroom, you can check them out on my channel as well. Uh, so check that out. Folks, um, Remember, it's us versus a test. Keep each other accountable. Keep each other studying for that test. Please don't let anybody get discouraged. I've read your stuff. I've looked at your quizzes. I've looked at your stuff. You guys are going to be ready for this test if you just keep putting in the work, and I know that you'll do that, okay? Us versus a test. I will see you in class. I hope you have a great rest of your day.